Thanks for watching. Our prayer is that this message will help you grow closer to God. Visit us at hwcagra.com for more great content. We are going to be jumping right into the Word here in just a few moments as we are gathering tonight for our monthly prayer meeting and thankful for you guys coming out tonight and being a part of this important time uh, together as the body of Christ. Every service, every time we have our doors open, church, I believe God for miracles. I believe God for transformations. How many believe for God to work in that way? But I firmly believe this evening that as we devote ourselves to times of prayer like this, it opens the door for those opportunities of spiritual growth, for that discipleship to happen. I believe it opens the door for opportunities to be able to share the gospel in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces. We believe in the power of prayer. Amen. Amen. And it's interesting to start that with the slide that I have on the screen for just a moment that says prayer does work. And notice we've crossed out the NT at the end of this, this phrase. Prayer does work. How many believe that and have experienced that in your own life today? We know uh, that, uh, that prayer does work. We believe in the power of prayer. That is exactly why we have set aside a Sunday night service each month dedicated uh, to worship and prayer, dedicated to seeking God, dedicated to getting on our knees and acknowledging uh, his, his awesomeness, his, his sovereignty, his power, his love, and, and calling on God to move mightily in our lives. And this year, the prayer theme for the Assemblies of God, as we uh, looked at in January, is leveling the praying field. And that is what we will be talking about at these prayer meetings these next several months. The idea is to make sure that we fully understand the power that is found in prayer. And someone may say, well, pastor, if we already believe in the power of prayer, then why do we need to make sure that we fully understand this power found in prayer? Because I believe there are sometimes we can approach prayer at, at incorrect angles, and I'm going to talk about that here in just a moment. But there is a cultural idea, there is a cultural uh, thought that would, would say the statement on the screen is true minus the red X. That prayer doesn't work. And that is the idea that I want to combat tonight with not only the, the truth that is in Scripture, but also in application in getting in these altars and calling on God to move mightily in this place, in our lives, in our, or through our influences, in our society. Listen, church, we can see, and I know I've hit on this before, uh, but I'm going to hit on this again. You can look at history, you can look at the decline of our culture, and you can trace it back to a pivotal moment when we decided as the public to take prayer out of our public schools, to take God out of the public arena, and you can begin to see our, our school academics level going down, you see violence come up, you see divorce come up, you see all these crazy things begin to spin out of control because we as a nation declared to God saying, we don't need you anymore. And I realize that there are some that have contested that and that we have prayed for our nation to get back on its knees and such. But friends, listen to me. We trend or we, we continue to trend closer to the secular side of things in America and we are paying a dear price for it. If you ever have a moment to research this, I encourage you, it's not hard to find the results. Google it, the effects of removing prayer from school, and you will be shocked. You will be shocked at what you will find. Church, prayer does work. And we need to remember that not only as a church, but we need to be proclaiming that as followers of Jesus Christ and setting an example that we believe in the power of prayer. 
We're going to focus on this very important aspect of prayer. We're going to address the reason why people, uh, in in a sense, do not pray. And while this is certainly not an all-encompassing reality, again, I fear this does impact many believers and non-believers regarding their prayer life or the lack thereof. Prayer is on the decline all throughout our society. And friends, again, I believe we need to change that trend. And it will change not only with the preaching of the word or with messages such as this, but I believe it will pray or it will change as congregation after congregation begins to understand and realize the importance that is in prayer. Hello? As we get on our knees and as we lead by example, as we call upon the name of the Lord for help, as our dependency lies in him tonight, church, I believe many will follow because they are going to see God moving in powerful ways. But it's going to happen through prayer. What is the goal of our prayers? What is the goal of praying? Why do we pray when we pray? Have you ever thought about these things tonight? Oswald Chambers would suggest this. In prayer, we should have no other motive than to know your Father in heaven. This is a very simple and meaningful concept, yet if we're honest about it, many folks would approach prayer uh, in a sense to get something in return. Is this what God has intended for our prayer life to be? I've been reading a book recently on the topic of prayer, and I came across a very interesting segment that was shared by the author. I shared this on Wednesday night, and uh, kind of as a, a, uh, 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 a glimpse or a uh, lead into what we're going to be talking about this evening, but, but this particular author tells a story of, of her uh, 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 time of writing this book on, on prayer, and she finds herself... Uh, in an airport, and she boards this plane, and she is seated right next to a, another lady who happens to be an author who has written many uh, successful secular uh, titles and, and uh, is, is well known. And, and so this, this gal that wrote this, this book on the topic of prayer thought, thought, you know what, this might be a really great opportunity to maybe learn some writing techniques. This was kind of her first go at it. And so she thought, you know what, some of this has been there and, and has seasoned in this. I, I might talk to this person about, uh, about writing books and, and uh, kind of pick her brain on a couple of things. And and so after they kind of go back and forth on some common pleasantries, the author of the book that I'm reading tells this other author about the topic that she was writing on, and that was the topic of prayer. And she welcomed her thoughts on the matter. She wanted to get her viewpoint, her, her, her thoughts on, on this idea of, of prayer. And this is the quote that she puts in there, and, and this is coming from another author, well-known individual. She says this, the reason people don't pray is because it doesn't work. Oh, it might bring peace to the person praying because they've given a voice to their concerns and meditation never hurts, but it's not how I, that author, uh, find peace. As you can imagine, this wasn't exactly the answer the lady was looking for. And again, I want to reassure us tonight that prayer does work. And I want us to understand that it is important that we approach prayer with the correct mindset. First off, I'm concerned with the approach that the secular author kind of brought to the table. We sometimes treat prayer like some kind of supernatural vending machine. God, if I say the right things, if I go through the right motions, if I lay these right things down, then I can expect to receive exactly what I am looking for in this particular situation. And friends, I want us to understand tonight as we, as we approach prayer, we should not approach it from a transactional standpoint. What do I mean by transactional? That we deposit a quarter into the vending machine, we hit D2 and we get our little Snickers bar out of the bottom. That's transactional. You go to the store, you get a Dr. Pepper out of the cooler, and you put it on the counter, and you, you swipe your card or put some money on it. That's a transaction. Are you following me? I give you this. I receive that. The game, you know, it, it, it's, it's over. That's not how God works. We should not be approaching prayer with a transactional mindset. Instead, I pray that we approach God with a transformational mindset. 
that through that time of communication, that through that time, as we take on, remember uh, several sermons ago, as we take on what we call the posture of possibility, as we open ourselves up to God, that we are not looking merely for a transactional uh, happenstance here with God, but instead we ask God to transform that situation to transform whatever it is that we might look, be looking for help in. And as we take on that mindset, as we take on that posture, church, I'm going to caution you, be ready because God always answers prayer. Oh, well, one of us believes that. Come on now. I don't know about you. But when we pray for God to do something miraculous in situations, I'm not looking for a mere trans or transactional uh, situation. I want God to transform that thing from head to toe. Amen. I want God to transform that life. I want God to transform that family. I want God to transform that entire situation in ways only he can. Let's not limit God's abilities by, by trying to inject our own reasoning or understanding into our prayer life, but let's trust God that he knows the exact answer that we need tonight and that he will, in fact, answer accordingly. Come on, church. It's not, not, not late tonight on Sunday night. We believe in the power of prayer. We believe in the power of prayer. Consumerism within our culture has certainly made its way into people's prayer lives. And when we approach God with a consumeristic or transactional mindset, then yes, I will tell you this, expect to be disappointed. Pastor, did you just really say that? Yes, I did. If we approach God with a consumeristic, hear me, with a consumeristic and transactional mindset, expect to be disappointed. Why? Because in prayer, what you're doing is saying, God, I want this according to my terms, not your terms. Are you hearing me? God, here's my plan. Here's my plan. See to it that it gets taken care of, please. Uh-oh. Hello? That's not the way prayer works tonight. Why? Because newsflash for us, God doesn't revolve around us. But instead, it is God who is in control. Oh, come on. It is God who is in control. It is God who is almighty, who is all-powerful, who is sovereign, who is omnipresent, who is omniscient. It is God that we serve tonight. It is God that we humble ourselves before, and it is God, church, that I believe who has a perfect plan and a perfect will for every single one of our lives tonight. Do you believe that tonight? We cannot approach prayer like a child. This was something I, I picked up out of this book again. We cannot approach prayer like a child presents a wish list to Santa Claus. Prayer doesn't work like that. However, I want us to take reassurance that prayer with the right mindset and approach does, in fact, work. In fact, it works better than we could ever possibly imagine tonight. Paul says in 1 John Chapter 5 and verse 14, it says this. This is the confidence, the confidence. That's a powerful word. The confidence we have in approaching, in, in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. Now, wait a minute, pastor. You just said that, or that just said, if we ask he hears, and if we know he hears, we know we have what we have asked of him. Yes, but there is something very important here that we do not want to miss. The key is in asking accordingly to his what? His will. According to his will. I've said it before. I'm going to say it again. God has a will and a plan for every single 
one of us tonight. God has a will and a plan for this church, for this corporate body. And I believe as we come together tonight, as we pray, I don't want us to pray what we want from God. I want us to pray for what God has in store for us and to humble our hearts because I can promise you this, church, we can plan, we can scheme, we can strategize all we want. We can get the biggest brains in this place, but can I tell you something? Minus the God's presence, it will fall flat. But as long as we rely on the presence of power of God to move in mighty ways, you better look out because I believe God is going to blow the doors off of this place with his fire, with his Holy Spirit, and we will see revival come to the heartland. Not my will, his will. Not my agenda, his agenda. Not my desires, his desires. We got to lay ourselves aside tonight and believe for God to move in ways only God can move. We got to stop settling for manufactured things that we can put up here. Listen, I'm all about uh, going through and, and, and having fun doing the, the lights and the big sound and all this kind of stuff. But listen to me, I'm not interested in trying to manufacture a good service. I want God to fill this place. I want God to fill my heart daily. I want God to move. And in doing so, move me out of the way. Do you understand what I mean by that? Move that self out of the way. Why? Because that self can become a distraction, can become an obstacle. And if we're not careful, church, we'll put that self in front of what God is trying to do and we'll miss it. God has a plan. God has a will for you and for this church. We know this and we believe this. And when we pray in accordance to his will and plan, church, I will say this with a guarantee as prophetically as I possibly can say this, we will see God move. If we pray, however, in accordance to our will or our agenda, then it might appear that our prayers come up short. I know I've told this story before. I'm going to go back to the Garden of Gethsemane. We talked about it this morning. When Jesus was on his knees, praying to the Father, if there be any other way, but not my will, your will be done. I had a pastor once preach a sermon to a congregation, and he said, God doesn't always answer prayer. See, he didn't answer Jesus' prayer. I think I've told you this story before, and I stopped. I, we were in the office afterwards, and I said, you know, you missed, I think you missed a very important detail in that story. He said, well, what's that? I said, God did answer his prayer. The answer was no. There is no other way. The answer was, son, this is my will. This is my plan. I don't think it brought God any desire to see his son hang on the cross at Calvary that day. But God's heart, as we know in 2 Peter 3, 9, is that none would perish, but all would come to repentance. And in order for that plan to become a reality, church, the price had to be paid. Come on. There was no other way. And we need to understand, church, as we pray in accordance to the will of God, God answers every single time. In fact, I would say this, even if we try to pray according to our will, God answers every time. And in my experience, when that has gotten backwards, the answer is almost every time, uh-uh, no, 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 you're missing this, Mr. Baker. Ever been there? And through the Holy Spirit and through that heart check, God helped me get back in alignment with his will and his plan. This is not about me. This is not about you. This is about what God has in store. And church, again, like we talked about here recently, I really want what God has in store. Hello? Because I know God has good things in store for us. I mean, come on. 
What better result could we have than eternal life with Jesus Christ, our Lord, church? Yes, we might experience some trials. Yes, we might go through the ups and downs. Yes, there might be testing of our faith, but church, as we persevere and as we press on and as we rely upon the power of God to carry us through, we can be certain that God has good things in store. Prayer does work. And what I want us to remember tonight is this. Time that is spent in prayer should be time that is spent aligning our heart with the will of the Father. Consider that prayer is the communication platform that we use to keep in touch with the heart of our God. When we are talking and listening, that's another key important part of prayer, by the way. We're good at talking. Hello? God, let me give you my laundry list of things that's going on here in Jesus' name. Amen. And then we kind of walk away. Man, let me give the Spirit time to speak. Just a side note. Give the Spirit time to speak. When we are talking and when we are listening, we become familiar with what pleases Him. As we tune in to what pleases Him, we find ourselves asking for what we, uh, what we carry in our heart, uh, that it also is in His heart, and it comes into alignment with His will. Church, I pray that we never get into a habit of judging the effectiveness of prayer based off what we receive and do not receive from God in the form of answered prayer. Again, God answers all prayer. Do you believe that tonight? And yes, church, sometimes that answer is no. How many have had those moments when you have prayed and maybe it's been an earnest prayer and God said no? Not this time. Have you ever been there? Anybody? I'll share a quick story, as quick as I can make it, because I want to get in these altars. Several years back, more than a decade ago, we were in transition. We were looking at moving to a new uh, position of youth ministry, and we had several churches that were contacting us. There was one in Indiana, one down in Galena that uh, were wanting us to come and, and be youth pastors. The one in Indiana had this facility. The, the sanctuary sat about 3,000 people. The, the youth hall sat originally was their sanctuary, and it, it originally sat about 1,500 people. It had a balcony, and in this balcony they had, I mean, you name it, foosball tables, ice hockey, or not ice hockey, air hockey, and pool tables and set up a little cafe thing up here. And I'm just thinking, wow, this is, this is really cool. And it had the parsonage situation for us. It had a, a, a great salary. I mean, everything looked like it was lining up. And, and we felt like, you know, this, this could be it. It was 14 hours away from home, which was a little bit of a concern. And we had asked for time to pray. We'd asked for time. Hey, can we have about 48 hours to kind of mull this over and, and pray about this thing? And and in that time frame, I get a call from that pastor, and he says, hey, I, I, I'm needing an answer. I said, well, we, we just got home, and, and we haven't really had much time to pray about it. And he said, I need an answer right now. And I told him, I said, if you're not going to give me the opportunity to pray, then the answer is no. And my heart, I could just feel my heart just, because I'm thinking, man, look at all these resources. Look at all these tools. They had a room uh, about the size of my office they had, a, they had a guy come in there, and they set up a full-on recording studio that had never been turned on. I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be so fun. And I remember I told him, I said, no. I said, if, if, if you're not going to give us that time we've asked for for prayer, then no. The answer is no. And that door was closed in front of us, and it broke our hearts. The church in Galena was a dear friend of mine that was pastoring the church, great opportunities. Again, would love to work with this individual. Uh, and, and I mean, our, our minds were racing on what God was going to do down in Galena. And then similar to what happened with Indiana, man, that door shut and God said, no. Oh, come on, God, what's going on here? What are you doing? All the while, there was a pastor in Emporia, Kansas that was waiting for our response. And we were taking these these, these steps in order as we had received an email. And I told him, I said, out of respect to these other positions, I don't want to consider 
two or three at a time. I want, I want to take each one one by one. And if it's God's will, then, you know, that will align up. And we got with, with Pastor Tony and Emporia. We met at a, uh, uh, what was it called, Montana Mike's in Dodge City. And it would have been like we were family for, for years upon years. I never met the man, but we sat there for four and a half hours and talked about ministry, talked about Jesus, talked about what God was doing. And we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that this was God's will for our lives. And God had us there for five years. And we saw God do amazing things in that youth pastor. Here's what came of the other two positions, situations that we could have not foreseen. Bedford, Indiana was a GM town. In 2008, when all of that stuff went down, so did Bedford, Indiana. Are you following me? The pastor ended up resigning very shortly after we had closed that door and, and uh, things that the church were not doing where God had spared us from this situation. Galena, Kansas, I think it was less than six weeks after we had closed that door of opportunity. That pastor had also resigned and was on his way out. Why am I bringing these things up? Because it's customary in the assemblies of God that if the senior pastor resigns, so must the, uh, the, the youth pastor offer their resignation. And then the new guy or new individual coming in will choose whether or not that person stays. Our job could have been gone in less than a year at either one of these places. God was taking care of us, and we had no idea that God was taking care of us. I have to believe that this last week, in, in light of the car trouble that we were having, that God was taking care of us. And can I tell you, God continues to take care of us in that situation. Financially, I mean, God is just, I'm just going to say this, God is good, church. God is good. And here's the key. Here's where I want us to go with this, is when we choose to pray, when we choose to seek God, and even sometimes when that answer is no, here is the deal. No matter what his answer is, will we continue to trust him? I pray our answer will forever be yes. God works, hear me, in ways that is often outside our comprehension. For instance, think of his timing for a moment. It's different than our timing. He is always working on our behalf. But church, listen to me, his timing, well, it's his timing. He's never late. He's never uh, early. He's always on time. And again, I want us to look back at examples in Scripture. Think of the biblical heroes, if you will, that operated in faith all throughout Scripture. Hebrews eleven seven 7, by faith, Noah, when he warned about these things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. They'd never seen a flood before. But by his faith, absolutely, I'm hearing a couple people have never seen rain. By his faith, he built this ark. The scripture says, by his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness that is in keeping with faith. He had never seen rain, never seen a flood. God said, build. He said, okay, where and when? Let's get this going. Hebrews 11, 8, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would uh, uh, later receive at his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Ever been there? Lord, where are you taking me on this ride? If God's in it, he's got your best interest in mind. Hebrews 11, 11, and by faith even Sarah, who was past ch uh, childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. Hebrews eleven thirty. by faith the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. Talk about a crazy battle strategy. Hello? You ever done any kind of deconstruction, any kind of demolition? Anybody out there? Nobody. Okay. okay. Ray says, yeah. We're working in our basement trying to get some things put together so that we could put, maybe have that possibility of doing foster care here in the future. I wish so bad that marching around that bathroom we're working on seven times would have taken care of it. We've had the dust, and we've had to chip out concrete, and we've had to put tear down studs and all this other, other kind of stuff. Man, I'll tell you what, this is crazy. God, you want us to do what? You want us to march around this fortified city, what? And expect the walls to come down? And we know that by faith they did exactly as the Lord instructed, and the rest is history. Church, does prayer work? 
From a secular viewpoint, it's hard to consider with topics such as time management, best practices, and corporate successes staring us in the faith. But if we turn this whole topic on its head and prayed simply out of obedience to the Bible, following the strong model demonstrated by Jesus and other men and women of faith in the Bible, if we prayed as such, if we prayed to foster a relationship with our Heavenly Father, then church, yes, prayer does work. Getting back to this question again, does prayer work? Perhaps those that say uh, no really mean that God responded differently than they expected or had hoped. I believe God answers all prayer. I believe God hears all prayer. And I don't necessarily believe that it's a situation where their prayers didn't work, but perhaps it's a, a failure to submit to the answer that God has given them through their prayer. Again, we want to make sure that we focus, we focus our attention on the will of God and not on personal agenda. So church, we can pray with confidence when it comes to praying in accordance with God's will. James Hudson Taylor once said, when we work, we work. When we pray, God works. God works even if we can't see the change or if it's not in our timing, his mercy and grace give us what he desires, or through his mercy and grace, he gives us what he desires for our lives. There is no doubt that every Christian ought to pray. Hello? There is no doubt that every believer in their pursuit of Christ ought to pray. Prayer is to every believer what breathing is to the body. The key in praying in accordance to God's will and fully submitting uh, uh, to uh, the answer that he gives, we must remain faithful. We are to be faithful in prayer. We are to trust in his understanding. We are to submit our heart and surrender our will to his. And again, no matter what the answer is tonight, church, will you? you continue to trust in him? I offer this to you this evening. Do you believe again God has a will and plan for your life? If you believe that, I want you to raise your hand. I want you to leave your hand raised for just a moment. We believe that, that God has a will, has a plan for our lives.